Welcome back, my name is Jesse. I am a tutor in Melbourne and I also make GAMSAT videos. We're gonna do the fifth installment of the physics crash course. So this is gonna be the final one as well, actually. I finished the chemistry one the other day. Uh, we're now gonna finish up the physics one. It's covering all of the key topics or the major topics that are covered in section three. Uh, and this one's gonna be going through electricity, voltage uh, and electric circuits, a little bit on capacitance and stuff like that as well. Um, it's about half an hour. I've tried to keep it all pretty bite-sized. We'll do a couple of examples of uh, some dimensional analysis and things as well which is something that they seem to be testing a lot in uh, the new kind of style of section 3 so it's a little bit maths based at the same time so hopefully you pick up a few other strategies in there let me know if there's anything else that you'd uh, like to see in future videos I will be doing more kind of strategic based ones along with all of the sample section 3 uh, walkthrough videos as well anyway we'll jump right into it okay so first off um, we have so what is charge right we're gonna go through these four questions of what is charge what is voltage um, what is current and then also what is resistance these are going to be the words that we use throughout um, so we need to have a good understanding of how they work so the first one what is charge um, we can just kind of think of it as an imbalance of protons and electrons we know that they're the positive and the negatively charged particles you can argue that goes further than well they're charged as well so what actually is charge but for the sake of it we're looking at charged particles and either we're literally talking about a proton or a neutron and in that case we just think of it as positive or negative or we're thinking about a particle where it has an imbalance of these amounts and so it ends up net positive or or net negative uh, it's also relative as well i'll come to that in just a moment so really simply if you had something that had for example two protons in the middle like a helium um, but it only had one electron floating around the outside then it means that you can clearly see that you've got two positive one negative that balances out to one positive so overall that would be a positively charged particle uh, it's also relative though so uh, we can think a good example of that is the resting membrane potential of neurons um, they are actually got negative charge on both sides of the the uh, the membrane of the neuron when it's resting uh, or not firing an action potential but we still talk about a positive and a negative side and the reason for that is just because even though they're both negative, one is more negative than the other. So therefore that gets the negative side label. And the other then is relatively less negative, i.e. relatively positive. It doesn't actually mean it is absolute positive, but it is relatively positive to the other. We can also look at that in compounds as well. We can see that two things might have a level of electronegativity, but if one is more electronegative than the other, then it is relatively more negative. And therefore we can say that on either end of a bond, we can have both a relatively uh, positive end and a relatively negative end. And that then creates polar molecules, which we talked a little bit about in the chem crash course videos. Um, then the second thing is what is voltage? So this one's a little bit of a trickier one out of the four. Um, so we can think of it, it's often described as a pressure that is caused by a separation of these charges now. So if we hold them apart from each other, um, then we can end up with a pressure or a force that's going to try and push charged particles through this space. And that's what we're measuring with voltage. So it's a measure of this pressure and uh, the amount of work energy needed to be done to move a point charge between those two terminals. So if we draw here, this is just my rendition of a little battery here. Just draw that in battery we've got the positive and the negative terminal so again relatively positive relatively negative if we were to try and move a charged particle like an electron for example between these two terminals it's going to take a certain amount of energy to do that and therefore a certain amount of work to do that and uh, the voltage is a measure of exactly how much work we need to do that per charge um, really though we don't move them from here to here we'd more likely attach a wire and try to run it this way but that would be the exact same thing. And that's how we then end up with electrical circuits. And then voltage is actually the measure of that pressure that is pushing things between the terminals. All right. Uh, it's also, I've just written up here, it's also called electromotive force or EMF as well. You might see that. It's a good way to think of it. Electro, so to do with electricity or to do with charged particles, motive, moving, force. So it's the force required to move an, an electrical particle or a charged particle. Then uh, the next one we have is what is current? So here the current is really actually a rate. It's like a speed. So it's the rate of flow of charge through a wire, right? Um, and we measure it. Charge I uh, didn't mention before is uh, measured in coulombs. It's a standard unit or capital C named after Charles Coulomb. I can't actually remember. 
Um, and so the idea is that current, which is measured in amps or amperes, we'll just say amps, usually use capital A for the letter, um, that is a measure of charge per time, which is actually uh, coulombs per second. So one amp is equal to one coulomb per second, like that. So it's the rate of movement of flow of charge. So you could imagine then that some materials will be really good at conducting this charge and allow it to move through without much resistance. Others will create some resistance to it. And that's where then this uh, last bit comes in. What is resistance? It's a barrier to the flow of charge or it's an impedance to the flow of charge, right? So it tries to slow down that, that rate. Um, we can think of it as like trying to, imagine you're trying to swim through water, you can move at a certain rate. Imagine then trying to swim through custard. It's gonna be a whole lot harder. So the, it puts up a greater resistance to it. This is the same thing every material um, or even device on electrical circuit, which we'll get to, uh, puts up some level of internal resistance and that will slow down the speed or the rate at which the charge can move through the circuit, right? Which is then going to affect its power output and everything else. There we go. So if we come along down to here, now we, we've wrapped up those four things. Now we can actually talk about Ohm's law, which is actually probably the most commonly used rule when it comes to electric circuits in GAMSAT altogether. Uh, they do not necessarily quote this. It's, they may quote it, but it's more likely that they'll leave it out. They seem to, from the practice, kind of rely on your reasoning and prior knowledge with it. Um, so it's really quite a simple one though. It's just voltage is current times resistance. So let's actually label those in. So voltage, nice and easy. Current is I measured in amps. And then here we have our resistance, which is measured in ohms, right? Again, everyone names their units after themselves when they find it. Uh, current in amps and voltage in volts, which is nice and easy. And obviously we can manipulate it. We can play around with it. I is V divided by R. R is V divided by I, right? So you could use one of those little, a lot of people do those little triangle things like V equals I times R. You could play around with those. Um, I never really found them all that helpful. I figured it was just easy just to know the rule. It's not all that hard to, to solve it, but if that is causing any trouble or confusion, you might want to go with, with the triangle. Um, so what we can do instead is rather than just kind of literally subbing in numbers and calculating, because that's really not what the test will do, is they're going to apply it in different ways, get you to reason with it, and it becomes more of a maths question again than it is a physics question. But we do need to understand the meaning of what is voltage, what is current, what is resistance in order to do this. And this is kind of what I really mean. This probably demonstrates a little bit better than I have in previous videos, is when people say it's a reasoning test, that is true but it doesn't mean that you can forego the, the theory entirely. So for people that are watching who don't have a background in physics, for example, you would struggle to actually answer a lot of the questions if you didn't know what voltage was, what the kind of components of it were, or uh, what the current is and how that's measured, because these are gonna then play into the maths setup of it. So once you've got it set up, then it becomes a maths question. But until then, you're relying on the science and the reasoning. So if we were to do dimensional analysis of resistance, which appears to be a relatively popular style of question from ASA, um, we're just trying to look at the basic uh, dimensions. So we have mass, which is capital M. We have length, which is capital L. Uh, then we have uh, time, which is capital T. And then what we're also gonna add in this time is I, which is gonna be for current, right? as well as a, these are the primary dimensions that we can kind of describe every physical value and constant in terms of. So the way that we can actually determine it, we won't do it as a multi-choice question, but it could be phrased as which of the following is the correct dimensions of resistance, right? So resistance is a bit of an unusual one. Um, if we solve Ohm's law for it, we get R equals V on I. And then what we can do is we can start going, okay, so what is voltage, right? So if you remember voltage, that was energy per charge, right? And then from that, current is actually one of our dimensions. So we're gonna leave that one just like that. So moving on from there, because remember that voltage was the work done per charge. So if we look at that now, really it's I divided, uh, sorry, E divided by QI or IQ. So then we have to start looking at the dimensions of these two non uh, standard or non-primary dimensions here. So energy, that was work energy. So work is force times displacement. And force we know from Newton's laws is mass times acceleration. 
so then times displacement. And acceleration is uh, speed uh, divided by time, right? Which is, you could think of its units, meters per square second. So that is length per squared time. And then distance is measured in length as well. So putting all that together, we can get m l squared t negative two, because it's being divided. That's gonna be our energy. We'll put that back in in a moment. Then we've got uh, I, which is already good to go. And then we've got Q. So what we have to do here is we have to work backwards from what current actually is. So current is charge per time. So if we wanna describe Q, then we can multiply the time across, get Q equals IT, which is another formula. But you can see you don't have to actually know all of them, you can derive a lot of them. And then this is I times the dimension T. So we can replace Q now with I times T. So putting all that together, we're now just gonna calculate the dimensions of resistance. So the energy was uh, mass per length squared or mass length squared per time squared divided by current multiplied by, and then Q was I times T like that. And so now we can see ML squared T negative two over, we can expand this out and we can get I squared T and then we can apply our index laws like this. I might just move this up a little bit. Uh, and so now we're just gonna do the second index law where we subtract powers when we divide. So m l squared, there's no pairs. T, we've got negative two, take away a one from the bottom. So that'll be negative three. And then we have i uh, to the negative two, because that's also from the bottom. So we have mass length squared uh, per time cubed and then per current squared like that. And that would be the dimensions of resistance. Just like that, so it becomes a maths question, but you wouldn't be able to set up that equation if you didn't know the inner workings of what is it, what is voltage, it's energy per charge, what is energy, it's force times displacement, what is force, it's mass times acceleration and so on, right? So it kind of all links across the topics. And so this is why these videos, I've done them in this order, because as we go through them, each time they rely on the previous one. So there's a sequence, so hopefully you've been following along from number one, um, makes life a whole lot easier. Uh, the second application that we can look at is risk ratios. So we know that with electrical circuits, the real risk is not with the voltage, but with the current. Higher current is the bigger issue. So they often have questions where they give you certain scenarios. So voltage, let's say, is 240 volts, and then the other voltage is going to be 110 volts. Uh, and then what they tell you is that the relative resistance in each case, let's say this one is 3000 ohms, and then this one here is 2000 ohms like that and they say what's the ratio right so let's call this set number one and let's call this set number two and i might just uh bring this over out here so i can get a bit more free space so if we were to compare the ratio let's say we do risk of setup one to risk of setup two they'll say something like that in the question they'll set, let you know which way to put the ratio so the risk of setup one well, it's uh, I of one to I of two because the current is actually where the risk uh, profile kind of sits. And so we know from Ohm's law, if V equals IR, then I is V divided by R. So we can replace I1 with V1 over R1 and compare that in the ratio of V2 to R2. And it becomes a maths question now. So we plug everything in. So V1 is 240, R1 was 3000. We're comparing that then to V2, which is 110 and to R2, which is 2000, like this. And then we wanna get a ratio. Now, with working with ratios, easiest thing to do is just treat that like a division, just put a line through it. And then suddenly, if you're dividing by a fraction, you times and flip the second fraction, things will get a whole lot easier from there. You can now pair off three zeros with three zeros, another zero here with a zero here, and you end up with 24 times two over three times 11, like that. And then I'm gonna keep trying to cancel so try not to actually do the multiplication. 24 and three, I can cancel that and make eight and one. Uh, and then eight and two makes 16 over 11. And then from there I can see that basically, if I was to call this 12 instead, just to make it a little bit easier, because it is an estimate, 16 to 12, I can then divide by four and by four, and I can get four divided by three, which is four, two, three. And there's my ratio of the risk profile, four to three from one to two, right? Simple as that. 
Cool. All right, moving pretty quickly, I wanna try and keep it pretty bite-sized again. Um, it's quite a bit of content, so we'll move through it at a reasonably rapid pace. Uh, circuit diagrams, um, these, it's probably good to review them every now and then. I wouldn't necessarily be laboring over them because most of the time they will explain them in the question, but these are the more, more high frequency ones that I would say you'd wanna be familiar with. So batteries are usually drawn as a tall line and a small line. The tall line is the positive terminal, the small line is the negative terminal, and the current is always going from this direction, so out of the negative terminal. Um, I like to think of it as the bigger line kind of pushing the little line in the direction it wants to go. Uh, or you could kind of see like a triangle forming like that. Uh, then you've got resistors, either a rectangle or a little zigzag line. Either one, they usually use rectangles in, uh, in the game set. Uh, light bulbs or other kind of unspecified loads are gonna be this kind of little ohm symbol almost. Um, looks like they're filament in a bulb because it is representing a bulb with a little circle around it or a cross. Uh, and then variable resistors with a little arrow. Switches open and closed. If it's open, the electricity or the current can't get through. If it's closed, it can. And then ammeters are usually put directly in, embedded into the circuit because they're trying to measure the current, right? An ammeter is a meter for amperes, measures the current through the circuit in that region. And the voltmeter is usually put in what's called parallel. We'll talk a little bit more about that, where it's kind of jutting out the side. It's kind of tapping into it to see what the voltage is across a certain position or uh, part of the circuit. And so again, it's pretty unlikely that they would give you straight up electrical circuits. They'd more likely give you some weird application that I probably can't predict, but everything will boil down to these two types and they won't make them overly complicated because it's not a physics exam. Um, it's a science reasoning exam. So the two main types are series circuits and parallel circuits. The series circuits, you can see all of the devices are put in a line with each other. So pretty much you have to pass through one to pass through the next and so on and go around, although I'm going in the wrong direction there. Um, like that. And so there's two things that we wanna calculate. We wanna calculate a total resistance of the circuit or what's called the R effective. Um, so RF or REF, uh, and that is gonna be equal to, in a series circuit, it's just gonna be equal to the sum of all the individual resistances that are in series with one another. Um, then the current, you just use Ohm's law, right? Just V divided by R effective, and that will give you the, the rate. So you can see that the rate at which the charge moves through the circuit is dependent on the total resistance, not just any one of them, right? Um, it's kind of like a relay race. The team will only finish in a certain time dependent on the speed of all four runners, right? Then uh, parallel circuits, they work a little bit differently. So here you can see that the, uh, the current will actually come out and it'll actually split. The voltage will split and it'll be able to go fully down here. So if we have six volts, you'll get six volts through this resistor and six volts down through this resistor as well, like that. And so you can individually apply Ohm's law to each one and get the current through each of them. Um, so I1 is gonna be V on R1 and I2 is gonna be V on R2, like that. Uh, the total current though will sum back up. So if you've got I1 kind of coming through here and I2 coming out from this pathway, oh, that should be a one, it's a bit messy. And then they'll add back up and you'll have I total. We'll put T like that. That'd be I1 plus I2, add back up. Um, it'd be kind of like if you have water flow through two pipes, obviously if they're going at you know 10 meters per second and 10 meters per second, they'll join up and actually contribute and then you'll get 20 meters per second. You could think of it that way loosely, right? I'm not an expert on fluid mechanics anyway, but um, here we go. Maybe someone's in engineering can uh, dispute me on that. But uh, the R effective is calculated a little bit differently. So when you've got them in parallel to one another, so literally sitting parallel, then it means that the R effective is used for, uh, calculated from this formula. So the inverse of each of them is added and then inverted back around. Right? The reason for that is because really it's one on R effective is equal to one on R1 plus one on R2, like that. But we're just shortening it a little bit. If you want to flip this upside down, you have to take all of this and flip it upside down. So the quicker way to do it is just to raise it to the power of negative one. Cool. All right, and that's really it for those. The main thing is knowing that voltage splits through the wires in parallel. So it doesn't split itself evenly uh, or like half half or anything like that all of it goes through both wires. Because remember it is just a pressure or a force. The pressure is there at the start before the split, the pressure is there afterwards. 
So there's no reason why it should halve itself. The pressure would not change. All right. Uh, then uh, we have capacitance. Now this one, I've only seen this come up in uh, Acer Test 1, the green book, but at the same time, it does seem like a reasonable application of math skills and physics skills at the same time. Uh, capacitance is actually not really taught in at least the VCE physics course. It's a bit weird that they say year 12 physics because the HSC has something different again. I don't really know what they teach their year 12s there. But um, capacitance is definitely not a very popular one in the VCE curriculum, at least. But uh, it's reasonable to assume that people can understand what it means. So we'll assume that it's uh, potentially examinable or that at least you'd have to be familiar with it. They'll probably explain it, but uh, at least being familiar with it would be helpful. So the basics of it are that capacitors are just a device that can store charge and then you can transfer that charge to another system or another circuit or piece of a circuit. And so from what I've seen, they give you this formula anyway. So I'm going to give it to you here. Charge is C times V, where C is capacitance in Faraday's. Q is charge again in Coulomb's and V is the voltage that was used to supply that charge. And uh, just in case Faraday is a little bit extra, one Faraday is 96 and a half thousand Coulomb's. Um, what that actually means is it's the charge of one mole of electrons. So even though one electron has a tiny, tiny, tiny little uh, charge on it, one mole of electrons is a lot because one electron only weighs 9.1 by 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. And if we're talking moles, we need to be in grams. So it'll actually then be 10 to the negative 28, but uh, grams. So you can imagine that you'd have a lot, a lot, a lot of them in just one mole. Um, and so, I mean, technically you'd have Avogadro's number if you've been following any of the chemistry stuff. So you'd have that many electrons, each one of them carrying a tiny little charge which actually adds up quite a lot. Uh, and then you end up with 96 and a half thousand. And so this is kind of what it looks like. So you would have uh, a circuit here where you've got a capacitor C1 and a capacitor here C2. What you're gonna do is you're gonna charge this capacitor, right, with a certain voltage. So you would attach it to a battery like this. A little positive and a negative like that. That's your battery. You would charge it up, you would put some charge into it, it'll store the charge, and then you can connect it, you can disconnect the battery. You can then connect this capacitor to this capacitor and then measure the voltage that you've gotten across and so on. And so what they usually ask is about how much charge has gotten transferred, and this is a formula that we can use. So the, the uh, amount of charge that will transfer to capacitor two is gonna be the proportion of capacitance two out of the total capacitance when they're joined together. So you can see here, here's capacitance two divided by the total capacitance C1 and C2, and then multiplied by the uh, the charge that was in from the first section here, Q1, we'll call that. So Q1 is delivered, it's held here, and then gets transferred, not fully, but partially to C2, and the proportion is proportional to C2 as a proportion of the total capacitance. There we go. So if, for example, we had, uh, let's say C1 was uh, two microfaradays and then C2 was three microfaradays and we used a battery at one volt, we would have delivered a charge of CV. So that would be C1, so two, this is in microfaradays, by the way. Uh, so then multiplied by one volt, so it'd still be in microcoulombs. So we'd get two microcoulombs. So therefore Q2, the amount of charge that transfers to capacitor two is gonna be C2 out of C1 plus C2 multiplied by Q1, All right? That's pretty messy. Uh, and so we can put that together and we can still work in, if they're both in microfaradays, we don't actually have to convert to exact or standard units. So we can say C2 is three microfaradays out of five microfaradays multiplied by two microcoulombs, All right? So three fifths of two microcoulombs like that, which will be six on five, which will be 1.2 microcoulombs will transfer. And there we go. If we wanted it as uh, a percentage that was transferred, then we just take this piece here, which became three fifths. And we know that that then would be 60% transfer and 40% retained on capacitor number one. Then next up we have uh, electric fields before we get into some interactions. So we've already done a little bit of field theory in terms of gravitation, but uh, you've also got electric fields. 
they somewhat behave in a very similar way. So you can kind of use a little bit of your knowledge and bridge it across from there. But uh, we've got to be careful because there's both positive and negative charges that we can be dealing with. So positive charges, their fields look like this. If we had a barrier, so ignore the fact that these are right next to each other. If this was isolated, the electric field should always come out uh, radially like this, straight out from the positive charge, from positive to something that is relatively negative. Uh, and then we have here, this looks more like a gravitational field, negative point charges, the lines come radially in from all directions and they're all equal in proportion to each other. Uh, and then we have another type of setup, we have charged plates, right? So with charged plates, um, you'd have a negatively charged plate and a positively charged plate and you have these very straight field lines um, all pointing positive to negative still and you get some slight bending on the outside ones. I don't think that they would really go into that. It's in the year 12 physics course but I've never seen anything to do with explaining the bending there. Um, and an application of that would be in gels. So gel electrophoresis in uh, DNA sorting. Um, that could be applied in the GAMSAT because it would bridge across both bio and physics. And then there's just a couple of formulas here as well. So uh, the electric field, which is usually given a little arrow at the top whenever you have a vector um, and fields often, because their vectors often have a little arrow, otherwise it looks like energy. Uh, and that is K times Q on R squared. So K is just a constant. They would give you that in the question, nine by 10 to the nine. Uh, Q is the charge again, at which the field is relative to. And then R is the distance from that point charge. And it has this inverse squared relationship between the field and the, uh, the distance as well, just like gravitation. So as you move away from that point of center, uh, then the field will decrease in strength, strength exponentially. You'll have a negative or a, we'll say an inverse squared relationship there. So if you double your distance away from it, you will quarter i.e. one on two squared, you will quarter the field strength. And then just like with gravitation, we've also got force of interaction between uh, a magnetic, sorry, an electric field and uh, an electrically charged particle. So it's K times Q1 times Q2 on R squared. If you notice though, this is the field. So really it's just field times charge. Um, and so if we had this here with the charge of Q1, and then we had another point, a little positively charged thing with charge of Q2, then we would have a force of attraction between them measured using this formula. You can kind of plug that in and I won't bother with the maths on it. We've done plenty of maths now, but you could obviously rearrange and solve and play around with the units and the dimensions on those as well. Uh, and then finally is when you're dealing with plates, then the voltage, we've also seen that it's I times R. You can also measure it as field strength multiplied by the distance. So the, the complete separation between the two plates. And since that's equal to I times R, you could probably play around, I've never actually done it. You could probably play around with something to do with equating these two and relating resistance to distance and that kind of thing. But uh, not too sure if that actually works, but give it a go and let me know. Uh, and then finally, so this is a type of question that could be applied in terms of uh, interactions. So if we had a negatively charged particle here in this little black space, we'll assume the white squares are wires that are conductive wires and um, we had a negatively charged particle in here then we want to predict what kind of charge would we have on the outside over here if all of these white wires are perfectly conductive so what would happen really simply actually is they trick you into thinking it's something more complicated if you've got a negatively charged particle in the center here it's going to draw away and going to make this side relatively positive. This is the inside of that first wire. And so just like with the membrane potential that I talked about, relative positive, relative negative, if this side, the inside of the white wire is positive, the outside should be relatively negative. And so therefore, again, we're gonna get positive and negative, positive, negative, positive, and therefore negative. So we can predict that the outside is gonna be negative and we could also predict the charge at any other position as well. Um, and the other thing is it won't lose strength, right? So assuming these are perfect conductors, the charge can jump across and we're gonna assume there's no loss of charge. So whatever the charge is here, if it was two coulombs, well then it'll just be two coulombs out here, negative two coulombs, just like that. And it'll be positive two coulombs over here on the inside and so on, just like that. Cool. 
All right. Um, well, there we go. That's everything. Uh, I think that actually wraps up most of the physics content we've covered now in five videos, same as the, the chem course as well. So uh, leave me a comment. Let me know what you've thought of this. And uh, if there's anything you think that I'm missing and you'd like to see, then let me know because I'll still keep doing videos and do more like skills based ones uh, alongside the section three sample walkthroughs because I know people really enjoy those. Uh, so we'll see a bit more focus now on strategy because hopefully this has got you up to speed with chemistry and physics and we'll probably also uh, end up doing a biology crash course as well if that's something that you're interested in so let me know about that uh, otherwise I'll leave it there I wanted to keep it at half an hour so I will see you in the next one